of the Spirit. Today we're going to look at the gift of faith. In uh, 1 Corinthians, let me, I'm going to go ahead and start there. And uh, we're going to look at the gift of faith. And Paul's going through the different gifts. And all of these gifts are supernatural gifts. They are there to help us, to strengthen us. They are supernatural because we need supernatural help to make it in this life. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, there's all kinds of battles going on and we need the power and the Spirit of God. And so he said in verse 1, now about spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And in verse 7 he says, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge. We looked at that last week. Today, we're going to look at, uh, by means of the same spirit, to another, faith. So we're going to look at the gift of faith today. Uh, by the same spirit to another, the gift of healing. By that one spirit to another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he has determined. So, God has given us these gifts to build up, to strengthen the body. The gifts have been given so that the supernatural power of God can work through us, his body. Now these gifts, well, first of all, they will magnify. They will, build, uh, they will magnify God. They will exalt God, bring God glory. When you see these gifts working, the first thing that happens is that it brings glory and honor to God. And secondly, it builds up the body of Christ. As uh, these gifts are being worked, if somebody gets healed, uh, first of all, it magnifies God. That person that has gotten healed is going to be built up. His faith is going to be strengthened. When God does something supernatural in your life and you see that happen, where, uh, you know, no one can tell you otherwise, then your faith has been built up. And finally, it is a witness to the world. Because when people start seeing these things happen, they are going to be drawn in droves to God because of his spirit, because of his power. And that's the way that it is supposed to work. So now we're going to be looking at the gift of faith. And I want to look at two things today. I want to look at, first of all, the hearing of faith. And then we're going to look at the heeding of faith or the doing. In uh, letter A, the disciples ask Jesus to increase our faith. Now there were two things that I can recall that the disciples asked of the Lord. And they kind of both go together. First, they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And here in uh, verse 5 of Luke 17, they ask to increase their faith. You see, when they saw Jesus praying, and as he was praying over the sick, and healing them, and anointing them, there was a supernatural work. And they recognized that as he was praying all night, as he was spending much time in prayer, there was a, an impact, there were things happening, and so they wanted God to, or Jesus to teach them how to pray. And that's where we get the Lord's Prayer. And so now, they're asking Jesus to increase our faith. Verse 5, it says this, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. Now, I believe among the crown jewels, we have the gift of faith. In 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. But these three remain. The Bible says that without faith... It is impossible to please God. I want you to think about that for a second. Impossible. There's very few things that the Bible says is impossible. As a matter of fact, in Luke 1.37, it says, Nothing is impossible with God. But here, when it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. How important is faith in interacting with God, our relationship with Him? Faith is a part of every aspect of our relationship with God. So the first question is, then what is faith? Let me give you a definition from Hebrews 11.1. 1. 
it says this, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. It is, first of all, the assurance. It is the belief. It is the knowing. I can't think of the exact word to say, but it's concrete. There is an assurance that you know, that you know, that you know. And it's a conviction of that which you cannot see. I want to tell you, like in my life, salvation is like that for me. I know that I know that I know more than I know what's going to happen tomorrow or next year, but when I die, when I breathe my last breath, I am going to be present in the presence of God. I am going to be saved. And you might think, well, yeah, you're assured of that because you preach and you do all this stuff. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the Word of God, His promise. It says in Ephesians 2.8, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this, not of yourselves, not by works, lest any man should boast. So, I have an absolute assurance knowing because of what God has said, because of what he has done in my life, that when I die, that I will stand before God. That salvation is a confidence. It is a belief that you cannot shake. Now, some of you, um, I have, you know, talking about germs. I have never seen a germ in my life. But my wife is absolutely convinced that our house is full of them. I mean, you know, she's just, uh, she's always cleaning. She's always doing this and that. You know, I pick something up and it's like, don't touch that. Why? It's full of germs. And I'm like, give me your glasses. I need to see this because she can see things. And uh, it doesn't matter where we go. We go to a, a, a hotel. She's got her whole box of cleaners that she goes and brings to the hotel. Go to Publix and she gets that uh, wipe for the, uh, for the buggy, you know, that type of, and you know, going into a, a restaurant, she pulls out, the, she's got a, like, a, like, a, like a gun, she pulls out the Perel, you know, and she starts the antibacterial. And we won't even talk about public bathrooms. I mean, she won't even go near that. And, uh, you know, because she has this conviction about germs. Now, when I was single, you know, I used to work on the, the barbecue and, uh, you know, the hamburger falls down and, you know, I just pick it up, throw it back on. And uh, <laughs> now that I'm married, if I pull something off the barbecue and it falls down, you know, I got to look around and see my wife is looking before I, before I grab it. I'm not, I'm not going to have a $20 steak sitting on the ground. <laughs> And my dog Bubba come in and eat it, you know? So, you know, so I go and she's like, oh, don't you dare pick that up. And I'm like, you know, we're kind of different. You know, I grew up on the farm and she's just got that, that thing. But, uh, you know, my dog Bubba, he, I've had him for about eight years. He is the healthiest dog I've ever seen. He's never been sick a day in his life and he eats everything off the floor. And, uh, you know, and, and if there's some soup or something, he'll lick the whole uh, tile. I mean, you know, so he's fine. But anyhow, my wife, she has a conviction, a belief. And it determines what she does when it comes to germs and how she operates and things like that. Well, faith is the same thing. When faith is working in your heart... It is a conviction. It causes you to think. It causes you to act. It causes you to walk in a certain way. And so when faith is working in your life, it will begin to change the things in your life. So Jesus goes on. He says, uh, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now that is absolutely amazing when you think about what is available to us when it comes to faith, what God has provided for us. I want to use an uh, illustration. I did it a few months ago, but uh, it works perfectly here, and uh, some of you may not have seen it. But my dad was a farmer, and he grew basil. 
and uh, I went to the store and I got a little packet of basil seed here and uh, we used to plant, I mean, fields and fields and fields, acres upon acres uh, of this basil. And it's the most amazing thing. I mean, you know, you can't really see it and it's really small, it's black. Um, the only thing that I can, you know, uh, uh, related to is that like you ever go into the garage or up in the attic and you if you see this up in your attic you're thinking oh that's roach droppings I mean there's just it's just a small tiny little thing but inside of that seed of basil is a DNA it has a structure it has a plant amazing it's incredible to me that you put this in the ground you put a little water on it and then one day this is what appears. You would think, oh my gosh, how does this little thing turn into that? But you know what? That's what happens with our faith. If we have faith as small as a mustard seed, it is going to grow if we begin to exercise and walk in it. And so Jesus is giving the uh, disciples, he's saying, you don't need that much faith. If you have just as much as a little mustard seed, you can move mountains, you can do almost anything. And if one of, your, uh, one of the goals of the new year should be to determine to increase or grow your faith. That's what the disciples asked. They said, Lord, increase our faith. So our faith can increase, it can grow. If, you're, if every goal that you set this year, you have a physical goal, you have a financial goal, you have a career goal, if all of those goals are met or exceeded, but your faith does not grow this year, I'm telling you, it's going to be a wasted year. You know, you make all your financial goals um, and you lose your job. You know, you get hit. You make all your physical goals, you know, and you get into an accident, and it sets you back. You make all your uh, career goals, whatever they may be. You can get sick, and things can happen. But your faith will not disappear. Your faith will always be there. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. As you are building your faith, that's where that you are banking it. You know, that the, uh, the rust won't rot, the uh, moth won't eat, and come in and destroy. As you build up your faith, so no matter what happens this year, if our church were to grow 10 times the amount in a year from now, but my faith did not grow, it would be a wasted year for me. Because all the things that we see around us are temporal, and they're passing away. But the faith is eternal. And we cannot please God without faith. Faith creates real change. It's a permanent change. It's an eternal change. And you know that old saying that the more things change, the more they stay the same. So you can go from a smaller house to a bigger house, a smaller car to a bigger car, a small TV to a big TV. But if you haven't changed, you know, it's just window dressing. There's no, it's a facade. There's nothing that's really taken place. But when faith comes and grows in you, that is real, eternal, lasting change. It'll change everything about you. And faith, it was likened to a mustard seed. So if the seeds of faith don't grow, the spiritual growth hasn't happened. And one of the ways that you can measure your faith measure your growth, because it's something that you cannot see, but I want to tell you that if today you are worrying less than you did a year ago or two years ago, if you are less anxious about the things that are happening, that means that faith is growing inside of you, because you're either going to have fear or you're going to have faith. And when you see that change, I've heard people in this church who've been here for a little while, they said, you know what? I'm not as anxious as I used to be. I'm not as fearful as I used to be. That means that faith is growing inside of you. And let me tell you something else about faith. You cannot have copycat faith. You can't get it vicariously from somebody else. I want to look at a scripture in Acts 19. 
and it's talking about Paul and it's talking about the seven sons of Sceva. In verse 11, this is an incredible verse of scripture. It's talking about Paul and it says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. And so incredible things were happening through Paul and his ministry. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, was doing this. One day, an evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Can you imagine? Do you see that picture? You see, they were kind of trying to pick up on Paul's faith. They didn't have the faith inside themselves, and the demonic powers knew that. The demonic powers saw that they had no faith, and so they overpowered them. Yes, you know, Jesus, yeah, we know. Paul, we know. But we don't know you. Let me tell you, the people who are the enemies of faith know who the real men and women of faith are. Let me tell you a story. In uh, World War II, uh, General George Patton, I mean, he was one of the best field generals in World War II. Now, how do I know that? He wasn't the most decorated. There was all different types of generals. But you know what? The Germans feared Patton. I mean, Patton, I mean, he was, he was a different bird. Uh, he really believed that God had placed him there just for World War II to be there, and he was blood and guts. And one time, uh, after the campaign in Africa, he was going and he was visiting all the sick and the wounded in the hospital tents, and he was there, and there was this one guy who was shell-shocked, uh, you know, but he didn't have any physical symptoms. And uh, Patton got so upset with him that he punched him. Told him to get back out on the field. Well, the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, pulled his rank and sent him back to the States, uh, put him on the shelf because of that. And so what happened was that the spies came back to the German high command and said, guess what? Patton has been pulled. His rank has been pulled. He's been uh, sent back to the States. And you know what they said? They said, no way. They didn't pull him. That's just a decoy. You don't understand what you're talking about. He's one of the best generals. I mean, because if, you know, if uh, one of their generals did that, they'd probably give him a promotion. They wouldn't cut him. And uh, so, you know, they're saying there's no way that uh, they could have done that. They just absolutely did not believe it. And if it wasn't for the Battle of the Bulge where they brought him back, you know, as the Germans were trying to make a, uh, a second run, trying to turn the tide at the end of the war, you know, and they put Patton back in there and they told him to just, you know, push all the way back uh, to Germany, to Berlin. And so that's exactly what he did. And he started pushing all the way back, went back to Berlin, and uh, the war in Europe uh, was over. And he was like, no, you know, let's push all the communists back to uh, Russia. He wanted to keep going. They're like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> don't do that. I mean, he would have ended the Cold War 40 years before it began. He wanted to push them all the way back. But the enemy knew who Patton was. That was the one general they were afraid of fighting. If the enemy knows us, then that means something is happening in our faith. You know, I don't know if we could ever know this, but I wonder you know, I would really like to wonder, you know, does the enemy know who we are? Does the enemy know who I am? Is there a faith working inside of me that causes a little fear and intrepidation from the enemy? 
That's what we need to be working for. If our faith is growing, if we are doing everything that God has called us to be, if we're becoming all that he's called us to be and our faith is growing inside of us, it is going to overpower the enemy because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. There's nothing that the enemy can do against us if God is with us, as he is for us, who can be against us? And so a lot of us, we're not walking in that faith. We're not growing in that faith to the point where the enemy begins to fear us. So where does faith come from? We talked about what faith is. Where does faith come from? Faith, and this is letter B, faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, I want you to listen uh, closely because a lot of us will reinterpret this by mistake. It says, faith comes by hearing. That's one of the emphases on that verse of hearing. Most of us will take that scripture and interpret it as faith comes by hearing reading, and reading the Word of God. That's not what it says. It says faith comes by hearing. Well, what's the difference? Listen, when we read this scripture, we're reading what it says in the Greek is the logos. That is the written word. But when that word becomes a revelation to our heart, It becomes a rhema, a revealed word to our heart. And so when that word is being spoken and it hits our heart, God speaks to it, it becomes a revelation in our heart and it changes and transforms our heart. There were a lot of people that Jesus ministered to. Not everyone believed him. They were hearing the words, but they were not hearing it in their heart. They were not receiving it in their heart. A lot of people can go to church their entire life, but if the change doesn't happen in their heart from their head, there's no change. There's no revelation. There's no rhema that is taking place inside of them. So when the Spirit of God speaks to your heart, there is that rhema. This is what Jesus said when he was battling Satan in the wilderness, when he tempted him, he said, hey, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, what? From the mouth of God. You think about all the times the Bible talks about hearing. Today, if you hear his voice, Harden not your heart. Jesus said, my sheep, they hear my voice and they follow me. You see, God is speaking to our hearts. We need to receive it in our hearts. And when that happens in our heart, it changes everything. And give you an illustration. About a month ago, when Janelle, when we had our dinner party, uh, Christmas party here uh, in mid-December, uh, I didn't know it at the time, that uh, Janelle... Uh, Sam's uh, fiance, Benny's daughter, young, pretty girl in her 20s, I mean, full of, you know, energy, uh, picture of health. Uh, she had this terrible uh, headache. She was getting nauseous, lightheaded, took her to the emergency. She had um, uh, her, her brain, there was a blood vessel that was leaking, and uh, so they had to go in and, uh, you know, do all this. So, Benny calls me the next day. This was Sunday. He calls me Monday and tells me about Janelle. So I go to the hospital, you know, and I'm there. I, my job trying to pray and encourage and lift up and whatever I can do to help. And so I'm there and all the family's there and uh, we're talking and Janelle. And um, Janelle tells me something. She says, the night before, when she was in the emergency room, while she was still on the stretcher, you know, and all this anxiety and fear came. She said, God spoke to me. And this is what he said. He said, it's going to be okay. Just focus 
on me. And there were just tears running down her cheeks as she was sharing that because that was a word from God to her heart. And as soon as she said that, I knew that she was going to be fine, that everything was going to work out because God said so. God spoke to her heart and he was going to make it all work out. There was a, uh, a person about a couple of months ago uh, come up for prayer after, uh, during the ministry time. And I, I was praying with him, gave him a few scriptures. I said, you know, when you go home, you know, it's kind of my, uh, you know, like, like the doctor, you know, take two uh, uh, aspirin and call me in the morning. You know, I usually give him one or two scriptures, call me in the morning, you know, that type of thing. So I, I gave her some scripture to read. So she, she goes home and she's sitting on the couch and she's got her Bible open and she says, you know, I'm going to go to the refrigerator. I'm going to get something and I'm going to sit down just relaxing and I'm going to read that scripture. I was amazed. She actually was going to do what I told her to do. And so she, uh, she goes to the refrigerator, she opens the door and God speaks to her and says, it's going to be okay. And I mean, and she just started crying. And but she called me, and I thought something was wrong. I mean, and I understand exactly where she's coming from, because it's happened to me before. But when God speaks to your heart, it changes thing. It builds faith. It gives you a confidence. It gives you an assurance. It gives you a conviction that you can't see with your physical eyes. That's what faith does. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so the Spirit of God has to speak to our hearts. And when you read the written word, when you read the Bible, pray for God to speak to your heart. Now, this is one of the things that I do nearly every day uh, when I'm reading the word. I read some scriptures out of Ephesians. They're actually prayers. And I'm praying for myself in Ephesians 1 and 13. And in Ephesians 1, 17, it says this. It says, keep asking or praying, keep asking that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That's the prayer and the cry of my heart. And so I'm asking God every day, Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation as I'm reading your word. Speak to my heart so that I will build my faith and my relationship with you. All right, let's look at uh, the second point here. I want to look at the heeding. The first part is to hear the word of faith, but the second is the heeding or the doing of the word of faith. Now, Jesus looked at his disciples and he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, faith without works is dead. When God is speaking to our heart, there needs to be a response from our life back to him. He's not just speaking to us to speak to us. He's speaking to us to build us up. He's calling us to faith and obedience. So faith, uh, letter A here, is a shield that protects us. In Ephesians uh, 6, 16, and this is where we talk about the armor of God. We talk about all the different parts of the armor that God has given us. In verse 16, he says this, In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The flaming arrows are meant to destroy your faith. You see, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what does the enemy want to do? He wants to destroy your faith. He wants to snatch your faith away. As God is sowing the word of faith into our hearts, Satan is trying to snatch the word out. This is what Jesus said in Mark 4.15. He was talking about the sower. And he says, as soon as they hear it, that it is the word of faith. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and snatches away the word 
that was sown in them. So there is this spiritual battle taking place even now. As the word is being sown, the enemy is trying to come and snatch that word of faith from you. Uh, most of us are familiar with Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin, you may not know this about Charles Darwin, his father was a minister. Charles Darwin himself was a clergyman. And what happened was somebody started telling him, you know, about what the latest science or whatever it was, that the world uh, wasn't that young, that it was billions of years old, and therefore creation couldn't have happened the way the Bible said. And it snatched his faith away from him, caused him to go in a completely different direction. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to destroy our faith. He wants to take the word and water it down, try and make it light, try and do things that steals our faith because it'll leave us powerless when we don't have the word of faith. And we got to keep building the word of faith inside of us. Everything outside is trying to destroy the faith that God has placed in you. I said it was one of the crown jewels. We need to guard and protect the faith that God is placing inside of us. There's a uh, old saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Now, nothing against the doctors and the nurses here, but I'd rather see you here during church than have to make an office visit while I'm there. But the idea was that, you know, if you have good nutrition, if you're eating well, then your immune system is going to be strong and you are going to be naturally healthy. Well, that's the same way that it works in the area of faith. That's what faith does. Faith protects us. It shields us from the attacks of the enemy. The uh, AIDS virus. Enjoy, make sure I, I got this right. It's the autoimmune deficiency syndrome. Did I do that one right, Joy? All right, I got it right. Okay, autoimmune deficiency syndrome syndrome. What does it do? It attacks your immune system. And once it is done attacking your immune system, you're wide open for destruction. You can catch a cold and die from it because there's no immune system to battle it. God created our immune system with the antibodies when something foreign comes in. A virus, a disease, one of those unseen germs comes in the body sends these antibodies that are going through your body, and you know, I don't know if it blows a bugle or what, but it says, hey, there's something foreign here, and they go in, they attack it, they overpower it. You know, scientists say that we get thousands of carcinogens in our bodies, but our immune system usually just knocks it out, knocks it out, knocks it out. Very few stick and get a beachhead. But when a virus gets in there, and it begins to overwhelm the immune system, you know, it starts cranking up the heat to try and kill that virus. You know, you're at 99 degrees, 100, have 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, trying to kill that foreign uh, virus that's in your body. Well, faith is working the same way. It is our immune system. It is our shield to protect the rest of our body from attack. Jesus, if you want to turn to uh, Matthew 16, I want to give you an illustration of how this actually applies uh, to us. Jesus, he asked his disciples, he said, who do people say that I am? And some said a prophet, some said a great teacher, da, 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 da. And then Simon Peter in verse 16 said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now listen to what Jesus said. He said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed. This rhema was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. 
He said, on this revelation that comes from my Father, you're going to be able to build your faith, you're going to be able to build the church, and the gates of hell will not come against it. When he heard from the Father, he spoke what he heard, and that was the revelation that came from the Father. And so, right after that, I mean, we're just talking moments later, Jesus begins to tell them about things to come. And it says in verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day and be raised to life. Now listen to what happens next. Peter took him aside and rebuked him. Now mistake number one. I would never rebuke the Lord Jesus Christ. I would never try to correct him. Kind of knew that something wasn't right there. But he rebuked him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. He's covering. He's protecting the Lord. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. What just happened here? In one instance, the Holy Spirit was speaking to Peter, giving him revelation. He had no idea what he was saying when he took Jesus aside and told him, hey, this isn't going to happen to you. The enemy was right there speaking through him. Jesus, he knew. He had spent all this time with his father. He had the revelation. He had the vision. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do, why he was there, what the future was for him, and as soon as this foreign alien word came to him that contradicted what he knew to be the truth, he immediately rebuked it and said, get thee behind me. That's where our faith needs to be. You're going to hear stuff out in the world that will contradict everything that you read and believe in Scripture. And if you can't recognize that attack from the enemy, if you can't take that thought captive, if you can't uh, you know, build your immune system and your faith, it's going to destroy your faith. How many well-meaning Christians have destroyed others by saying things that had nothing to do, did not come from God, and they received it, you know, they were corrected about something in the flesh. They received it, and they went out, and they said, I'll never go back to that church. I'll never go to church again because they're all hypocrites. They got destroyed by the enemy. They did not have the faith to be able to take it captive and to rebuke it. And so the enemy is there trying to sow seeds to destroy your faith. Why? Because if he can destroy your faith, then without faith, it's impossible to please God. It leaves you powerless. It leaves you helpless in your spiritual walk, and it opens you up to the attack of the enemy. Let me just uh, hit that one more time. Ephesians 6.16. Taking up the shield of faith for which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Do you see that picture? The enemy is shooting all these flaming arrow, arrows at you, but it's your shield of faith that's protecting your head, your helmet of salvation. It's protecting the uh, breastplate of righteousness and all the other parts, all the vital organs of your faith. It's protecting that. Back in the uh, 70s, there was this huge boxing match, one of the biggest boxing matches of the century, 1977. It was the Thriller in Manila. You remember that one? That was Muhammad Ali and uh, the grill man, George Foreman. I mean, and George Foreman, he was young. He was in his 20s. He was in his prime. And this guy, I mean, he was a mauler. I mean, he actually, well, when he came back in his 40s uh, out of retirement, he actually won the heavyweight championship. I mean, he did it in his 40s. This guy was considered to be unstoppable. I mean, he was just a beast. Big, strong, just, you know, punch. And Ali was kind of getting out of his prime. And they thought Foreman was going to eat his lunch. And so uh, they're in Manila, and, and he's fighting. 
and Muhammad Ali started a strat, did a strategy nobody had ever heard of before. And uh, he came up with this strategy because he knew he was not going to be able to take Foreman toe to toe. He wasn't going 15 rounds with this beast and winning. And so he did what was called the, the rope-a-dope. And uh, he just put his hands up and he just let Foreman, I mean, round after round, he just beat him senseless. But he had his shield of faith up. He wasn't hitting him, he was hitting his hands, he was hitting his arms, he was hitting this, and round after round, and uh, Ali was saying to him, he was saying, come on, George, is that all you got? Is that all you got? You know, five rounds, six rounds, come on, George, you can hit better than that. And by the eighth or the ninth round, it finally got to George, come on, George, is that all you got? He says, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> and uh, he had exhausted himself, and then Ali knew. Then he went on the offense, and he knocked George Foreman out. It was the most unbelievable fight uh, that happened. As a matter of fact, kind of a backstory, I heard him on an interview just a few months ago. He got saved that night in his dressing room. He was so filled with anger and everything else, and to lose the heavyweight championship of the world just so devastated him. Oh, God spoke to him. And he got saved. And uh, he went into the uh, ministry. And uh, he, he, that was his last fight. He retired. He was never going to go back in the ring again. And uh, he was a minister for many years. And then, um, you know, when they needed money for the ministry, he thought, well, you know, I know how to fight. And so he went into the ring to raise money for his ministry. Now, Tim, if we get tight on money, I'm not going into the ring. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'll probably send Bill Eshelman. He can go do the WWE. You know, he's retired. But, you know, he, uh, um, you know, the, the, he put up the, uh, the shield of faith. And I, I want you to think about that because that's what we're supposed to do. Our faith is supposed to shield us from all the fiery darts that are coming from the enemy. And as your faith takes those thoughts captive, you know what you ought to do? When the enemy comes and attacks you with worry, how are you going to pay your bills this month? Just tell them, is that all you got? Tell Satan, is that all you got? Man, when you go to the doctor, they're going to be a bad diagnosis. Is that all you got? You know? You know what? Amen. You got things that the enemy is trying to pound over you, and all you have to say to him, is that all you got? You know what? Because that's all he's got. That won't overcome you. You can take that shield of faith, and it will protect you from all the fiery darts of the enemy. So we got to let that word get inside of us. We need to have that word there so that when the enemy comes, we can put up the word of faith. All right, look, one last uh, scripture here, and I'm going to close. Letter B. Faith without works is dead. And I want to look at one more scripture, Matthew 14, 25. And this covers again the faith and the fear that we deal with. And Abraham, if you want to uh, come and get ready for us, in uh, verse 25, this is where Jesus walked on water. It's an amazing story when you stop and think about it. It says, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walk, walking on the lake, they were what? Terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in what? In fear. Okay. They're not walking in faith. They're walking in fear. So Jesus speaks to them. Take courage it is I, do not be afraid. Now, Peter, he jumps out, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out on the water. Come, he said. Now, listen, the only reason Peter could walk on water was because Jesus told him to come. He was standing on the word of faith. When Jesus said, come, he immediately had the ability to walk on water. If any of the other 11 disciples would have asked to walk on the water, I'm sure 
If Jesus said so, they could have just got out on the boat. They could have all been walking on water. But he said, call me to come out. He said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. So far, so good. But when he saw the wind, he was, what's that word? Afraid. Fear got back into his heart, and he began to sink, crying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Do you see that picture? Here it is. Peter, I mean, one of the only men ever recorded in history besides Jesus to actually walk on water. You know, I would have probably gotten the boat, you know, wet and everything, but it's high five and everybody. Did you see me out there for a little bit? You know, but Jesus, he said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Do you see how easy it is to go from faith to fear? It just took him taking his eyes off Jesus and beginning to look at the wind and the waves. And then his mind kicked in and said, I can't do this. <laughs> How can I? He's a fisherman. I know I can't walk on water. And he began to sink. God spoke to Janelle and said, it's okay. Keep your eyes on me. Focus on me. Listen, you're going to go out today, and maybe before the day's over, that attack is going to hit you. It's going to try and steal the faith that God is planting inside of you. You have got to guard. You've got to put up that shield of faith. Don't receive those words. Allow that word of faith to grow in you richly. Be that plant that God is creating, that mustard seed that grows into a faith that builds up your life. This year, make it your intention. Make it your desire and your plan to grow your faith. You're going to have to hear his voice in prayer, be in the word, shut off the things, the people that are sowing seeds of doubt, sowing seeds of discord, sowing, if anything that is, is uh, hurting your faith, identify those things and do not let it come in because the enemy will do everything in his power to destroy your faith. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand and we're going to pray together and give you an opportunity. This is a time, and here's one of the promises of God. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. If any two agree as touching this one thing, we can have that which we've requested. There may be a need in your life. Maybe you don't have this faith and you need it for yourself. You can't get it vicariously. If you need prayer, I want to give you an opportunity to come up and pray.